What a beautiful Sunday it is. So thank you for joining me on Super Soul Sunday. In 1996, the spiritual-based books, Books of Angels, Embraced by the Light and Saved by the Light, were all bestsellers. One of the most rewarding things about doing the Oprah show all those years was that I could make a few calls, bring in people who were touching a nerve across America and around the world, and just have a fascinating, enlightening conversation. Nothing I love more than that. So some of the authors, like Betty Eady, who wrote Embrace by the Light, said that they had been to the other side. Now, this is some kind of conversation to be having on television. And they wanted to share those lessons with the rest of us. Back then, angels were becoming a cultural phenomenon, or dare I say, trendy. Whatever was going on energetically, there certainly was, I, I, I call it a hunger for something more, for meaning and a hunger for answers to some of life's biggest mysteries. I want you to start thinking about how you would answer these questions. What question would you ask God if God was in the room with you right now, in a physical sense? What do you want to be remembered for when you die? Do you believe that prayer can change the outcome of events? These aren't your average do you want fries with your hamburger kind of questions. Uh, there's a book called This Little Book of Big Questions that says that if we learn to ask ourselves the right questions in life, that we will all start to feel a lot better about our so-called troubles. So we're gonna start doing that today. The first question is, if you were in a room with God, what question would you ask him, Tracy? With so many religions in the world, which one are we supposed to believe? That's the one thing you want to know. Mm -hmm. I know. I said to the producer, the question I would ask God, I would ask him, why did he make us humans with choice? Mm -hmm. I mean, because since he already knows what is going to be best for us anyway, just do that. Mm -hmm. Jill, what would you ask God? Well, I don't know that I would ask him a question. I would probably stick out my hand and say, I'd like to shake your hand. I'm glad to meet you because I wasn't really sure that you existed. Really, you're agnostic? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And why aren't you sure? I believe in the human spirit. I believe we make things happen. Mm -hmm. I, I believe I'm the master of my own destiny, that I'm in charge of my life, and nobody is planning my life for me. Mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. I believe that, too. I'm not sure that there is a God. Nobody can answer my questions when I say, what is God? But do you believe, like, in if you don't call it God? Because I really do think people get hung up on the whole God issue. And whatever that force is, that whatever you want, want to call it, I don't think that it cares what it is called. Of all, if it, any power that is omnipotent, I say, isn't hung up on an ego question of what you call it. So could you believe in a force of nature, yes. a spirit, a power that somewhere there is, mm -hmm. in the color purple, you remember that book, mm -hmm. the movie? Alice Walker s describes that there's a rhythm to the, to the universe. Could you believe in that? Yes. I believe more in nature um, and the power of love. Do you believe in love? Yes, Well, absolutely. then you believe in God. I'm sorry to tell you, you do. But I'm see, sorry. I don't call it. Why call it God? Uh, you believe in God? Oh, you believe in God. Why do you and call you know it God? what? You don't have to call it God. I don't call and it God. And you don't have to call it God. And God does not care. You don't have to call it God. Because if God is love and love is God, it does not matter what you call it. You are OK. Sit down. You're no longer agnostic. <laughs> No, really, you don't have to call it God. And I think that is why so many people are hung up and so many people feel like they cannot be in touch with their spirituality because they're hung up on traditional ways, traditional ways mm -hmm. we have been told mm -hmm. what God is. And, you know, I was raised Baptist, honey, which means, you know, we were in the church all day and, you know, God is... And I was sitting in church, I was in my 20s, and I was listening to the preacher talking about the Lord thy God is a jealous God. Yeah. And I started to think, mm -hmm. why? Right. Why would God be jealous of anything I could do or anybody else I know? So, yeah, get over that whole thing, yeah. Okay? Your sisters believe differently, is that true? Yes. Right. You disagree. You do right. believe in God and you call it God. Yes. And that's okay, too. That's okay. Do you believe that prayer can change the outcome of events? Do you? Yes. yes. Absolutely. You don't? Absolutely. Absolutely. You do. You will by the time I finish I talking to you. You do. I'm trying to okay. Don't, don't, I'm not trying to convert, but I convert you, too. I don't know. No, to believe in God. You already do. <laughs> That's your opinion. Do you believe in the power of thought? Yes, I believe we can make But you change. believe in the power of thought, that thoughts carry energy into yes. the universe? Yes, exactly. Okay, so what is, the diff what is a thought 
carrying itself, its energy into the universe, if it isn't your like heart's desire, what is prayer if it isn't like your heart's it, it desire? It is, but people say, God answered my prayers. No, you answered your prayers. Oh boy. <laughs> okay, what's the most important thing you have uh, learned in life so far? Brian's gonna answer that question, Brian. The most important thing that I've learned is to value other people's lives as much as I value my own. Mm -hmm. Really, where'd you get that lesson from, brah? It seems like people constantly subordinate others. Mm -hmm. And if we were to sort of rise above that and really value each person, every individual, I think it would be, make a huge difference. Do you believe angels can help people when they're in trouble? Paula and Mrs. Speck, do you believe angels? Yes, I do. Um, my mom, we live in a tri-level house, and my mom was upstairs and couldn't breathe. And I was downstairs sleeping, and an angel woke me up and shook me and twice. It was like, Paula, Paula, wake up. And I woke up in a panic, and I ran upstairs. And what did like, the angel look like? I didn't see him. He just woke mm -hmm. me up, did its mm -hmm. job. Woke me up, I ran upstairs, and I was like, Mother, and she was leaning on the edge of the... Um, her bed and was like, it's time to call 911. And if the angel didn't wake me up, then she would have died. Okay. So it was definitely You, you believe angel. the same? She doesn't. No. Okay. I, I don't believe that angels wake you up. I think that is possibly intuition, mm -hmm. possibly observation, and I just don't accept the concept of angels. Okay, I have a story to tell you, and you tell me if this, and you too, Jill, tell me. <laughs> if this is an angel or not. Do you have that clip back there? We did this show not too long ago about the kindness of strangers. And on the show, there was a gentleman, white gentleman, who said that he felt like compelled to go to this certain location to go fishing. And um, I I'll let, you, let him tell the story. Go what ahead. I had a compulsion to walk to the Hermosa Beach Pier. And I didn't know why. I would, I'd be so upset. I'd be kicking trash cans. I'd stand out, out on the end of the pier and say, why am I here? I met Frank in that that feeling just left me. And the only time I needed to be there was when he was there. I was on dialysis at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. My wife took me out there to try to break this monotony, what was going mm -hmm. on. And he was standing over about four or five feet. I didn't pay any attention to him. And then he looked over my arm and he saw my shunt. And then all of a sudden, you know, he looked and said, what would it do, what would it take for you to, to get away from this machine? I said, a kidney. And on the next day, he called me up and said, Frank, I'll give you a kidney. Wow. And he said, give me the name of your doctor. Then the next thing we did, we went down there for the DNA, and we matched up like brothers. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, what made you do that? I don't know. I think the grace of God just made me do it. It was destiny, because I moved to Hermosa Beach, gave him the kidney, and then moved away from Hermosa Beach. He offered his kidney to a total stranger. Now, do you think that was just a nice guy? I think that was a very fortunate coincidence. I don't think... I, I think it was good people rising to an occasion. Would you say that there's some kind of miracle something in that, though? Yes, I would. I think God works through people. I agree with Jill mm -hmm. that God works through people. The spirit of love mm -hmm. works through people. But you call it coincidence. No, I could, as I said, I, I would go with the spirit of man and the goodness in people. So. Okay. When we come back, Betty Eady's story about dying and meeting God is famous worldwide. When we come back, Betty tells the rest of her story, secret she says that all of us can use to live a happier, more fulfilling life. But first, what was the very first notion of God you remember having? It maybe could help you understand your spirituality or lack of it today, children at LaSalle Language Academy here in Chicago shared some of their thoughts with us. I will ask God um, how, how he does his magic. My daddy told me when God looks over um, a white person, he turns white, and when God is over a black person, he turns black or brown. Some guys can be in different places like Mexico, Tennessee, Illinois, um, Chicago, lots of different places. If I were in the room with God, I would ask him if, if he would let my grandpa live till my bar mitzvah. I don't know what God is, but I do know where he is. He's in our heart. 
Susan Robinson is a, psycho a psychotherapist and the author of this book. It's a wonderful book if you want to get a great conversation going in your home, with your family, with your friends. It's called The Little Book of Big Questions. He says that within minutes after asking certain questions like the ones we're asking here today, people can start making more of a spiritual connection with them, their friends, their family, their loved ones, and ultimately with yourself. Because one of the problems in life is we go through asking all the wrong questions, isn't it? And if you get the right questions, the answers will come. Right, the, the wisdom of the universe is in a convenient location, like that little girl said, it's located in our heart. And if we ask the right questions, we can point us back to that, back to the love and peace that we really are all yearning for. Right, and that's really what, in, in spite of all the struggles for money and the superhighway and the houses and the cars, we're really just looking for that feeling, that connection, isn't it? Exactly. The bottom line is that's it. And questions are a very practical and simple way of doing that. You don't need to meditate in a cave. You can just ask questions and get back to that heaven within in yourself. Start thinking about it. Joining me now are three people whose books about their own profound spiritual experiences have been worldwide bestsellers. All are here to tell us what they've learned about how ordinary folks can make powerful spiritual connections. Daniel Brinkley is the author of Saved by the Light and At Peace in the Light, his story of dying twice. He didn't even get it the first time, had that twice to get it. It's known as one of the most <laughs> remarkable cases ever documented. Take a look. 20 years ago, Daniel was clinically dead for nearly 30 minutes after being struck by lightning. He was being taken to the morgue on a gurney when he says he came to life. 14 years later, he was again pronounced dead during open heart surgery. After that, he changed his life completely. His dramatic story was recently aired as a television movie. After that, dying the second time, he completely changed his life. Sophie Burnham is the author of several best-selling books on angels, including A Book of Angels, now in its 41st printing after selling millions worldwide. That book describes her life, how her life was saved by an angel who she says stopped her skiing out of control off a cliff. She also wrote the follow-up bestseller, Angel Letters, and she says angels are there to help us develop our inner self and reach our goals. They're not just pins to wear on your collar. And Betty Eady is the author of Embrace by the Light. It's a blockbuster book that's been on the New York Times bestseller list now for over two years, often in the number one spot. She's just released a video called An Evening with Betty Eady, which includes visuals of what Betty says she saw when she died. Take a look. Betty Eady's amazing story about dying during a routine hysterectomy, going to heaven, meeting God, then coming back to tell about it has been detailed here on this show and worldwide in her book. Betty says that her most important discoveries were secrets about life itself. And fortunately, Betty says, we don't have to die to learn those secrets. We don't? No, you don't. Is God hung up on what the things we're hung up on? Did Absolutely you see God over not. there? Yes, I did. I mean, I learned while I was there that we were his spiritual children and that we uh, chose to come to this earth for this experience, but we are literally co connected to him, uh, into, uh, uh, connected to his divine love. He is within us just as our parents here on this earth are within ourselves. When you saw God, did you call him God? No. No, mm -hmm. and as you were saying earlier, it did not uh, matter what his uh, name was. I thought of him uh, more like a parent, uh, again, as my father. What's it like over there, Daniel? It's magnificent. It's the most deeply attaching nature of spirituality. What we really have to look at is that we are all basically powerful spiritual beings. We're not poor, pitiful humans trying to have a mystical, mystical experience. We're powerful and mighty spiritual beings having a human experience, and we're just trying to get good at it. We're just not good at it yet. Well, how come we can't get that? And how come we can't be reminded of that all the time? Because there's sometimes I'm in it. I'm in there, and I'm thinking, I'm a spiritual being. I'm a spiritual being. And then that human stuff starts to hit me, and uh, but usually about the time I hit the studio in the morning. And it's uh, you, you lose sight of it sometimes, you know, because we are in the flesh. But isn't that at the point when you are learning I mean, your greatest lessons are earned, bought, and paid for experiences. I know. Some days I don't through. want to learn nothing, that, though. No, we don't. Yeah. But you see, remember what this human ex experience is about. It's for our ability to come from that side. This is, we're not from here, we're from there. To come from that side you to know here. this oh, Daniel. unequivocally now this woman just said Jill earlier was concerned because Jill was saying she believes when you die that's it is it possible <laughs> uh, is it possible 
that <laughs> some people die and that's it. They go back into the earth and that's it. Forget and it. then others don't. If you know what I know, and like Betty knows, you're so happy that you don't know what to do. I think the people who should be locked away are those who are trying to extend life to 150 years because I want this thing here to wear out as soon as possible and for me to get back to where I went those two times. That's so there's the... nothing to be afraid of with dying? Absolutely is not. Is there like a moment? Is there like at least a hiccup where you go, oh, I'm dead? I'll tell you something. In both experiences that I had, the last thing that I would think about was that I was dead. I was having too much, uh, too much of a good time exploring this new world I was entering. When you lift out of your body, you're surrounded by love. And everyone who has a near-death experience says this, but they don't really realize that they're feeling themselves again for the first time. And then you begin to have a true value of what you gave up to come to this earth life to help create this overall picture oh, for a spirit to evolve. Up. I have to stop you on that one. To have a body is a very precious and joyful and wonderful thing, and we do a huge service by agreeing to come down mm -hmm. and I take agree. on the suffering of this world. Wasn't that the whole point of Jesus of, entering, the Jesus the Spirit entering the flesh to show you? Yes, but it's also ours. Yeah, I, I know. I mean, we each one take on this thing. It's not just Jesus or something. No, it's we're all here as divine every beings human for being. this experience and to yeah. experience pain. Well, we're here to experience everything on earth that will uh, create in us. You're, you're frowning because you don't think we're here to experience in pain? No. I believe that we come to work within a system and use a certain dynamic to evolve ourselves spiritually. If we know we're spiritual, and that within us is the power and the spiritual dynamic that we chose and were chosen to come here, and as we work this out, those things are not as significant as the overall spiritual growth of ourselves and what we're making happen. As we work these things mm -hmm. out, yeah, it's the working that out is, that kind of gets us hung up, Daniel. <laughs> I can understand. <laughs> it's, it's the a, working it out. It's the working it, out. You might not. Now, the lady that got up—you heard the lady talking about angels and how she didn't believe in the concept of angels. What would you like to say about that? Well, I think that's all right. She doesn't have to believe in the concept of angels, and they don't mind. <laughs> We're going to find out more about the concept of angels. What's it like to die? And do you think there's anything you do you can do to increase the likelihood of something miraculous happening in your life? How you can bring more miracles into your life? Sophie is going to tell us how simple it can be when we come back. But first, some celebrities we've talked with about uh, their profound spiritual experiences. We'll be right back. Put me here to play basketball. That's where I had my fun, my peace of mind. I came back because God, we, we've been praying on it, and we prayed on it a lot together. And uh, he answered and said, go back. And that's what I'm doing. The only way that we can go from a tumultuous relationship to being each other's best friends, the only way I can go from having incurable disease that they tell me is going to kill me to being in complete remission, the only way that we really do anything in this life that's worthwhile is through love. If I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that uh, what we do on earth affects us after we die, I certainly would live my life differently. I've done a lot of things I shouldn't have done. I probably would treat everybody a lot better, be a lot nicer person. It won't make any difference if I flip some guy off on the freeway, but yet it'll make tomorrow miserable for me. It doesn't make me feel any better at that moment, but I don't think it'll make any difference whether what happens to me for eternity. God made us all imperfect. Okay. How does what we do here on earth affect us after we die, do you think, Daniel? What you have is, in the course of the near-death experience, you have the panoramic life review. For me, I started out my life as a basic jerk. And so as you have the panoramic life review, it means that there is a place as you make this transition that you will literally see your entire life pass before you in 360-degree panoramic life review. Even people you flipped off on the freeway? Oh, even those. I mean, <laughs> when you start out as a jerk, and but the key to this is this, Oprah, you will literally become every person that you've ever encountered, and you will feel the direct results with your from your interaction between you and that person. My first life, I got to feel all the torment, pressure, all the aggravation, humiliation, and anxiety I'd put on so many people. Then when I had my second near-death experience as I became a hospice volunteer, what happened was I got to become the people who I had helped in transition to know what it's like to walk into a room with a person that no one's been to see in 10 years as they're laying in a program waiting to die and no one's come to see them in 10 years and the joy on their face to know that one day you're going to become that person and feel the direct results of your interaction between that person is what changed me. See, you and many others I've talked to in the past 
10 years of doing this show nationally and two years before that say the same thing. And I think this is great, whether you want to call it God or not. In the Life Review, everybody who I've ever talked to or read about who crossed over to the other side says that the force of love is so strong, you can't even begin to describe it. There are not human words to describe it. And they all say that it's also so fair because everything you did, you then get to feel. Everybody, how you treated everybody, how you behaved and conducted yourself but in this life. What that tells, I think that's pretty good for God to no, be that but What fair. it tells you is there is not only a life after death, it's a great and wondrous adventure. There is fairness, justice, and righteousness, which is something that we've all looked for in this human experience. But to know literally that there's a place that that exists, what I try to write about and talk about is the way at which people can take from the near-death experience incorporate it into their lives every day and begin to change and prepare and, and alter the way they're looking at themselves knowing that this is going to happen. Okay. Now, well, a I'm lot of people are concerned, and some of these women over here were saying they were concerned because they think you're glorifying death. So many people who are watching who are in trouble right now. Yeah. I don't want them to listen to you and think, oh, it's so great over there on the other side because the reason why you're here as a human being is to work out your stuff. That's Honey. right. That's Work right. out your stuff and to learn the lessons so that you can I believe evolve that, to the next level. I believe level. what we're doing is glorifying life. <laughs> I'm trying to give people the, the advantage of having to learn what, what goes on when you leave this world so that they can incorporate it in their life and move closer to spirituality. But I think at the root of everybody's life, as we are so hurriedly racing through it, just trying to get through and trying to survive, is that we are all trying to connect to that feeling of love and fulfillment. How do you believe, Sophie, we can begin to experience miracles on a daily basis? Because I was just saying to the producer, we just kind of rush through our lives. The basic thing is that you have to be still. You have to have a few minutes during the day where you take a walk or where you meditate Something that is very quiet, very stilling, and you stop the thinking mind. And when you stop the thinking mind, it flips off into another part of the brain, believe it or not, and whammo, you've got it. You've got that sense of absolute transcendent peace. But what about those people who feel like they're really good, but all this stuff is always happening to them? They're really good. The things that come in our, into our lives, in fact, when you find that someone is having a particular uh, difficult time in their life, that these people are uh, graduating. To you know, Maya negative. Angelou says to me, what you do when the trials come, you thank God then. You thank Absolutely. whatever force you, exactly you, 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 you call God. You thank God then because your faith is so strong that you know all it is is a little test and that you are going to graduate. And the and more the test part you of it is, looking you to put miracles and quality in their life mm -hmm. and how they should do it, then do a good deed. Look to how to help someone because one day you're going to feel the direct results of your interaction of helping that person. If you know that, then it becomes systematic. More questions First. when we come so. back from the little book of big questions to get you thinking about your life and what do you really believe and why is your life the way it is? We'll be back in a moment. If I died tomorrow, I think I would regret not telling my mom and my dad how much I love them. I would definitely regret not having a baby. I don't think I would regret anything. Or maybe one thing, not spending enough time with my oldest son, he was killed last year. Yes, Brian, your question was? My question was just that what if you don't have a near-death experience? I mean, how do you make the transition Here. into a more spiritual person, you know, productive member well, of society? I think that's what I was talking about, that you have to take, take some time to be still with yourself and meditate. Mm -hmm. Learn to right. meditate and be quiet. And second, to and take... it doesn't take long, 15 minutes a day. Yeah. But how does that help you when then, you're in the actual experience? It will, okay, we'll tell you in a minute. Go ahead. Yes. And then second this way, Brian. What you do is if you're going to have a new, if you're going to leave this world and you're going to go through a panoramic life review, then at the end of each day have one. Think back through every person, and if you were that person, how you would have reacted to that person or felt their at reaction to you. And you'll be amazed at the next morning as you go out in your life, how you when you're treated. talking to someone, you become cognitively aware of how they will receive what you're saying. You're not only beginning to affect your, their, your life after this one, which you would truly have, you're beginning to bring that life and that world over here to I operate. Have to, I have to interrupt and say also that prayer is helps 
that prayer is a very, very important. You have to ask. You have I will to say ask this too. And you have to be able to receive. When you, when you have gotten the prayer, notice it and say thank you. This is what I found. The way to have a better life is to appreciate the life you have right now, wherever you are. In this second. In this moment. In this second. That's how you do it. I swear to you, that is how you do it. And I started doing something just this year as a part of, you know, just as a part of the discipline because I'm a person who's bombarded by so much stuff and so many things and so many people that I started to feel that if I don't, you know, hold myself in the center, mm -hmm. then I can lose sight of who I am and be defined by all the stuff. So at the end of every day, now I keep like, I've always kept a journal. I keep what I call a gratitude journal mm -hmm. where I just list at the end of every day, and it takes just a little few moments at the end of the day, the things that I'm most thankful for. And they are the simplest things. Like last night, it was the feel of my comforter and the pillow with the wind blowing through the, 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 the feeling blessings. of being safe and warm when the rest, you know, in Chicago, that's a good feeling, actually. Count, counting right. your blessings, a part of a panoramic that's life review, yeah. to count your blessings. That's great. Right. And the other day, it was just the feeling of gratitude when Mrs. Clinton met my dog. You know, it's just every day, it's something else. Yeah, Oprah, every day it's something. Um, about two and a half years ago, I lost my husband to lung cancer. And I think after Ray passed away, and it got, but it took that to do it, I found myself. But isn't that what the journey is all about exactly. here? Isn't that what you yeah. were saying too, Sophie, That's that it right. really is? But you were talking about Dante. Being, yeah, yeah. Oh, I was saying that when Dante goes to paradise in the Divine Comedy and he sees God, he finally gets up to say, asking to see the face of God and he's, and he's given this he sees himself. and he sees mm -hmm. himself. What he sees is his own face. Because we are co-creators. One thing you learn about death experiences is you all of a sudden realize the importance. Now, she just frowned at the co-creation. Co well, well, we'll well, talk yeah, to her during a commercial break and explain difficult. what you mean by that. Because people always think you're being sacrilegious. It just means you're given choice. So in every day, you have the opportunity to make choices that determine your destiny. create the world that you live you in or make the world, the world that you better live in. that you live in. I'll be right back. Solitude has brought me a lot of joy lately, too. Just uh, the silence of being alone and the calmness and peace that I've only recently begun to achieve for myself. I used to be a much more social animal than I, I think I am now. The panel has been discussing the spirituality and the forces of God, but I also believe that there are two forces that are here with us, that we do have our, our, our God that we can depend on, but there's also a power of darkness that we do need to be aware of. And, and that's you, where the choice is. Do you begin. believe that and that you can choose between one or the other? Most most absolute definitely. Yeah. Now, we are given that choice. Now Marianne uh, Williamson says in her book Return to Love that we're always walking in the direction of one or the other. That all of your actions in life, either you're moving toward the darkness or you're moving toward the light. That's right. She calls it fear and love. There's this wonderful book called Ishmael by Daniel Quinn, which talks it which which is Anyway, it's a gorilla talking, but anyway. Uh, it talks about one of the points it brings out is one of the mistakes that human beings make is believing that there is only one way to no. live. That's and right. that we don't accept that there are diverse ways of being in the world, that there are millions of ways to be a then human how do being. We please and, God? and many ways, no, but many paths many to what you call God. That and is her pleasing. path might be something else. And when she gets there, she might call it the light. But her loving and her kindness and her generosity brings her, to, if it brings her to the same point that it brings you, it doesn't matter whether she called it God along the way or not. And I guess the danger that could be on that, I mean, it's, it sounds great on the onset, but if you really look at both sides, I there could be couldn't a possibly be just one way. What, what about Jesus? Jesus? What about he Jesus? Even brings him up in this whole discussion, and you say there isn't only one way. There is one way and only one way, and there that is through be. Jesus. There couldn't possibly be with because a million you of people say in the there world. Isn't. There couldn't possibly be. Because you say, you intellectualize it and say there isn't. If no. you don't believe that, you're all buying into the lie. But that makes you right. No. Do you think, do you think that if you, if you are somewhere on the planet, where if you're, some, if you're somewhere on the planet and you never hear the name of Jesus, you never hear the name of Jesus, but yet you live with a loving heart, you lived as Jesus would have had you to live, you lived for the same purpose that Jesus came to the planet to teach us all, but you are in some remote part of the earth and you never heard the name of Jesus. You cannot get to heaven, you think? And that is covered in the scriptures, too. People are talked about Truly. that. 
God knows the heart. Does God care about your heart or God care about if you call his son Jesus? Well, you know, Oprah, God, Jesus cannot come back until that gospel is preached in the four corners of this earth. So, you know, figure it out. Okay. Okay, I can't get into a religious argument with you. It's not religion, Oprah. I can't get into a religious argument with you, Jonathan. It's not religion. In the Bible, it says the important thing is to love God and love each other. Right. And the question is, how can we get back to our center? And there's questions that help us to stay back on center like a trusted friend that we can ask every day, how can I serve, how can I love? And those are the most important questions. Right, so if Jill is asking the question in her life, which is one of the things she's concerned about going back to community for, She's asking the questions, how can I serve? How can I love? Which is what Jesus came to the planet and asked us to do. But she doesn't use the name Jesus. And there's no problem with that as far as I'm concerned. I measure people You're by saying how there's well a problem they love, with that, how well they feel peace, how much glory yeah. they no, give in I'm their life. No, I'm talking about how people, what people do with their hearts and how much they love. No, that's how you people, that's how we see it. We aren't listening to God. We're listening to us. But God, doesn't God, do you argue that God would, doesn't want us just to love each other as we oh, would? No, 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 I would never argue that at all. That's love God as God first and then love each other second. That's absolutely what he said. But I'm saying, are you going to hang her up because she doesn't use I'm the name not, God or Jesus? I will Jesus. embrace her and love her, but God probably is going to, Oprah. <laughs> that's why I don't believe Read his word. Read See, his See, that's why word. she said... Okay. I say that there's a difference between religion and spirituality, Absolutely. and we're making it, we're, we're confusing the two. Absolutely. Religion is what we build up after you have a spiritual experience of some sort, mm -hmm. after you have had some image of the divine. Religion is a structure that absolutely uh, restrains and keeps the spirit back. The greatest sin that is created here on earth, and I was told this by God, if you can believe that I experienced God, that in that is fear and guilt because Satan or negativity will bind you to it and it will keep you from progressing, keep you from going on, and keep you from learning about God. And it's a control. I know, but see, this is I interesting. As you that said that this, this man just said, well, that's not one of the seven sins. But fear is the root of all the sins. The all is. sins are the result, right. re the result fear of, is, of fear. The fear yes. of what happens in the afterlife well, what creates those fear psychologies. What about Satan? Well, the biggest trick Satan pulled off on his universe was convincing the universe that he didn't exist. And he's still tricking people to this day. We all know that darkness exists. We know that. We know that. And we have the choice what between... What about forgiveness? That is the key that and the most key. important that part of spiritual growth. That's to the key to love. The but key to unlock and get rid of any of this is love. We don't ask God to forgive us when we do wrong. I think the biggest well, sin is pride. We don't forgive others I'll when they do us wrong. We need to ask Well, I'm not going to get into an argument over what the biggest sin is. I'm not going to do that when we get back. We're going to... It takes more than a talk show for that. When we get back, we're going to ask you this. If you were not inhabited by fear, inhibited by fear, this is the question, can we just agree that fear is one of the biggest faults? Let's see, it when is. you call it sin, too, people get hung up on the word sin. A but sin would you is a not breaking agree of that, any law. Audience, look, could we not, 300 people in a room agree, yeah. agree that fear is what inhibits us and hold us, holds us back from moving forward in life? Would we agree with that? No, no, I'm not talking about that kind of fear. If you were not inhibited by fear and if you knew you wouldn't fail, what would you be doing in your life? We'll talk about that when we come back. That's the question we're coming back to. Don't call me new age. I'm not new age. I don't believe in that. Let's get back to your question. What was the question we were asking if you before the break, John? By fear, what would you be doing differently? Or how okay, you, the question is if you weren't inhibited life? by fear and then. When you use the word fear, people say things like, oh, it's the unknown. What we're trying to, to convey here is that for every dark emotion, feeling, dark experience in the world, it, the root of that is always fear. You look at jealousy in your life. You look at your inability to move forward because, you know, you, you, you're a fear of confrontation. You look at every problem that exists in the world. If you break the problem down, it comes back to 
fear. Would you agree with that? I'm not talking about afraid to go out into the world, afraid to leave your home and so forth. We're talking about that kind of fear. Right, right Betty? Absolutely, that kind of fear. And I was told that that, that uh, kind of fear will keep us from God. Allowing the Spirit of exactly. God to come through you. Allow the Spirit of the God and the light to uh, come into you and uh, the light will chase out all darkness. And so, which the darkness and the fear with it, it, that lies within us, and then we can expand and so, go on. And so all the darkness is a result of people being afraid. Afraid. They're uh, afraid. Well, exactly. this woman uh, behind me, what's your name? Can I call you? Kathy? Kathy was just, during the commercial break, I don't know if y'all heard, Kathy was trying to read me. Uh, Kathy was telling me about, you know, being new age, and I would like to say this, go on record. I am not new age anything, and I resent being called that. I am just trying to open a door so that people can see themselves more clearly, and through seeing themselves can perhaps see the light that gets them to God, whatever you wish to call that. I don't see the spirits in the trees. I'm not... I don't sit in a room with crystals. I don't see the spirits in the air. I would never have said. Yeah. No, there's, there, there, that's a real, um, there is a difference. Yeah. When, but when you embrace some of this stuff, this, right. this angel stuff, that, now you guys gave the angels all the power. God gave the angels the no power to be with us. No one gave the angels all the power. No okay. no okay. all the power. Okay. I will tell you no. that the angels lead you to something else, to God, and as we call it. But it is like so impossible to understand God. It some is so limitless that, that you no need a mediator. Yeah, let, 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 let Sophie, let Sophie finish. God, so they need angels. Yeah, let and Sophie finish that. No, because well, it isn't that you just need yeah. angels. Also, they're well, there. It's, it's I think that what we're on. I'm trying to get across to people as going through these two experiences and being with literally a hundred people going through this experience, that the quality of this life, that there is a spiritual system by which we leave this world and how we come here, and that comes from God, the greatness of God. Isn't so, the point God. how to live a better life as I'm a human being, how to be in touch with the spiritual part of yourself as a human There's being? There's something else I want to say. I think that everybody is different, and each person's experience yeah, so. of God is different, and we must respect that. To That's someone who think. sees God as Jesus, that is very precious, very sacred, very holy, very real. Another person sees God as Buddha, and we must absolutely respect each person's entry into God. It's like the spokes of a wheel. The center of the wheel is God, and there are many paths all leading to that center. That's what I've been trying to say, but I Go ahead. It's the Jesus in us that that's what I absolutely agree. If you think that the Jesus in us is, is bigger than the Word, it's not you and me. We don't have the control. I, I, I think we're just talking about Jesus. And I, I, know I don't want to go, I don't want to sit here to and not Jesus. let anyone know that Jesus isn't in my life. I love Jesus. Don't tell because me I don't Jesus want to touch Jesus. Is a, yeah, don't talk about name. Jesus. In front of me, in front of don't try to talk about I'm, Jesus. I, I was embraced by Jesus. Yeah. And so I can't deny him. Jesus exists for me. And it was told to me while I had, during my experience, that uh, anything that uh, keeps you from God is a sin and it's not good. And that can be religion, that can be other people, that can be anything. Yeah, that could be but uh, that it, eventually, even after death, that we are going to continue in growth until we learn, and this is where my experience with Jesus comes in, that Jesus is the Son of God. We're going to come to that. After um, we've died, no matter what we did in our lives, no matter if we were agnostic or um, no matter pagan. what, do we all go to heaven? Do we all get to go to heaven? We, Who goes to heaven? We hell? begin the early, the early it's processes it's that a, a person a goes through is that. But remember, Jesus was the Christ. When you hear the term Jesus, Jesus the Christ. I find the it Christ is a to Greek. Talk only about Jesus. The Christ there are consciousness and is loving that self, la many, loving many, thy neighbor many, as ourselves, and doing to others as we have others do it. I am not interested uh, in creating a Jesus. spiritual matter as a religion, and I think it is wrong for us to speak speaking in terms of religion rather than in terms of spirituality. So what you're saying is there's one God, but He created Buddhas well, and well, all right. Trying to he be gave neutral everybody. Here. You've something. made your point. Absolutely. You have made your point. Why would He do that? Being a Christian, I've been so patient. It is. I agree with you. But no, but okay? listen. Why wouldn't he do that? Why would he do but that? But why wouldn't he do that? Because, because he knows beliefs. there's such diversity in the world. Why wouldn't he do that? Yes, ma'am. Old Testament and New Testament says this. 
You love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's, That's your right. whole being. You love your neighbor as yourself. That's what Jesus stood for. That's in the New Testament. That's in the Old Testament. But what all the religions say that. And what but all you, the other religions you, stand for. religions say that. Every religion, religion stands, stands for that. and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Every, but every, Everyone. every, 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 tell her please, Sophie. Every religion <laughs> says that. Every religion me. says this. Every okay, religion. Okay, you tell me. What, what religion matter. says that? I want to know. The Sanctuary. Buddhist. Buddha, Hindu. The Epic of Gilgamesh. Every religion. Hindu. Uh, every religion. Zoroastrian. Some that exist predate Christianity, religions that predate Christianity by 10,000 years tonight? still doing it. But look, we are spiritual no, beings. I have lost the, the power of this show. I have completely... We will be right back. Jesus, step into the studio, please. We'll be right back. Back in a moment. Thanks for watching the best of the Oprah show on Supercell Sunday. You know, it just, it still just astounds me that centuries later, we're still fighting about the path to God. Haven't we learned by now that it's the getting there, it's the connection, it's the experiencing of that which we call God that's important. How you get there is certainly up to you. After all the conversations I've been a part of over the years, some of them pretty heated. The one thing I do know for sure is that the door to an open heart, which is what I call and define spirituality as, is to allow each person his or her own way to God. Mm -hmm.